Uh, boa tarde. Hello, everyone. And thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you to the organizing team for inviting me to come here. Uh, so I'm here to talk about a pretty controversial topic, which is causality. But uh, I first want to talk a little bit about me. Um, so my name is Katia. I'm 23 years old. And I just finished my master's degree in biomedical engineering. And my research interest is in computational neuroscience. So what I like to do is build models that help me understand how the brain works. So I actually have to program a lot. So please include me in your group. Um, and I also like to dance. You won't be seeing any of that today. Uh, but this is pretty much all you need to, to know about me. So as I said, I'm here to talk about causality. But I, I, I want to know who here uh, already took a statistics class, either in your bachelor's, your master's, something like that? OK, so it's, it's well, most of the people have. So you probably jumped into this sentence somewhere along the way, that correlation does not imply causation. This is people from statistics saying, hey, I'm just saying that they're related. I'm not saying that there's a cause between them. Um, and I agree with that. Uh, so correlation, essentially, for those who don't know, essentially tells us how similar two variables are. And it, people tend to overuse it. So a lot of people have been working on trying to find a uh, relation between variables that seem, <coughs> I would say, odd. Uh, for example, apparently, the number of people that, that die in pool accidents is highly correlated with the number of movies that Nicolas Cage appears in. I hope they are, these are not causally related, otherwise Nicolas Cage would be unemployed. Or uh, the cheese consumption and the number of people that die entangled in their sheet beds, which is something very strange for me. But I like cheese, so I hope these are not related at all. And for you, it seems like a joke. Um, but um, correlation tends to be overused, and people tend to uh, get a lot of relations from correlation that should not be analyzed. And for this. Imagine that we have two variables, x and y. Uh, the fact that these two variables are highly correlated could mean several things. It could mean that x is causing y, or the other way around. There could be a third variable that is causing those two. Or the examples that we just saw there, the variables share a high correlation, but there's not really a relation between them. And it's very important that we are able to distinguish these events, and especially in biomedical research, which is what, I, what I'm working on. So it's very important that we, we are able to distinguish it. But if we cannot infer causality from correlation, then what the hell is causality, and how can we analyze it? So causality essentially is defined as the relation between two variables, where the changes in one variable leads to the changes in the other. This is, is essentially the concept behind randomized control trials. So you probably saw already where we want to test the, if a medication works in a specific treatment. What we do is that we maintain everything constant. We change the medication, and we analyze the changes in the treatment. The, tra the changes that we see in the, the treatment can be only caused by the changes in the medication because everything else is maintained constant. So this is widely used in biomedical research, and it's very important. However, this concept of intervening with the system, going directly there and changing one of the variables and seeing the changes afterwards, it's not always possible. Uh, I'm sure that uh, several of you have that sm uh, friend that smokes, and you're always trying to tell him, oh, you should quit smoking. smoking. It causes lung cancer. And he tells you, well, show me the paper that says that. And you, you say, well, I cannot put 50 people smoking for 30 years and see if they have cancer in the end. And you lose the discussion. Uh, so it's very important that for us, without testing or without changing the system, that we are still able to, to recover the causal relations. Um, another possibility is that intervening the, with the system is just too expensive. Uh, in neuroscience, when we want to know if uh, uh, two brain regions are connected, what we do is that we go to one of the regions, we activate it, and we, we, we see if the other one lights up or not. As you can imagine, uh, building something that can directly activate a specific neuron, it's quite expensive. And if you're trying to find just random relation, relations in the brain, it's very time consuming. And so essentially, I'm here to present my thesis that uh, focuses in the second uh, problem, which is to use causal inference tools 
only from data, so essentially we let the brain do whatever it wants, so it goes bananas, and we just see if from that activity we are able to recover the causal relations between the variables. Okay. Yeah, so the method that I'm here to present is called convergent cross mapping. So the, the thing you need to remember about this method is that the only thing that I'm giving to the method is the time series, two time series variables. So in this case, I have the activity of the, the neurons throughout time. I don't assume any model, I just assume that the relations are nonlinear because that's what, what we assume about the brain. Okay, but I want to give you some intuition on what causality means in this, in this uh, context. So the state of the art in neuroscience and causality in, uh, in neuroscience is Granger causality. And this comes essentially for, from the intuition that we have about cause and effect. We think, okay, we have this event that is the cause, and after a while we have the effect. So we assume that the cause always precedes the effect. So what we do is that we try to use the cause to predict the effect. This is the state of the art. With convergent cross mapping, we do the exact opposite. We assume that if X is causing Y, then X must be leaving some information in Y in such a way that I can use Y to predict X. So what I do is I use the effect variable to predict the cause. It's the precise opposite of what our intuition uh, tells us. And if you forget everything that I said, uh, that I say here today, please remember this, that at least conversion cross mapping, we use the effect uh, to predict the cause. So we have these two variables, so we have x and y, and what we do is, uh, if we're trying to predict x, we have y, and you do a prediction on x of x based on y. And we analyze how good our prediction is by comparing the predicted variable with the original variable. Okay, so this is essentially the metric that I have here. When I have rho of x knowing y is how good my prediction is, uh, a, 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 accounting for uh, knowing why, uh, why beforehand. So if this value is high, what I have is that X is leaving some information in Y in such a way that uh, that information is enough for me to recover X from Y, okay? So for us to get some intuition into this, imagine that you have uh, unidirectional causality. So on, only one of the variables is, is causing the other. In this case, X is causing Y. What we have is that our prediction is good when we're trying to predict x from y, but when we're trying to predict y from x, our prediction is not good because uh, y is not leaving any information in x, so we cannot use x to predict y. Um, similarly, if we have some kind of feedback, in this case, x is causing y and y is causing x, both variables are leaving information on each other so we can use them to predict each other. So in this case, our prediction is high in both cases. Okay, so this is our, these are essentially the key points in my presentation, so everything you need to know for now about convergent cross mapping is this. Once again, the key concept is that you're using the effect uh, to predict the cause and not the other way around. And Besides being able to recover that two variables have a causal relation, you are also able to see in which direction that relation occurs. And the most interesting thing is, uh, is that in theory, um, this model works better when the correlation between the, the signals is very low which means that with this method, we are able to recover relations that we could not see before because we thought the, the variables were not even related in the first place. And this is very interesting, especially in, in, in neuroscience because some of the brain regions responsible for the activity of other brain regions actually don't show a, a similar pattern. But uh, I can talk a little bit more about this uh, later. Okay, so you expect me to be uh, working on uh, human brains, but I'm not. I'm using uh, a very friendly animal model called zebrafish. So a zebrafish is a very small fish that when he's young, he's transparent, so you are able to see uh, the whole brain. So this, combined with specific imaging techniques that I'm not going to explain, we are able to record the entire brain at the same time and get the resolution of each cell. So from this, we get the, act, the neural activity of each neuron on the majority of the neurons of, of the brain. 
Okay, so this is our, essentially our data set. So we have 10 fish in total, and we have around 80,000 neurons per fish. And this is what our data looks like. So we have uh, times, so essentially each of, the, each of the neurons is a time series variable. And we have the activity of the neuron throughout time. Essentially, we have a bunch of time series variables that we can use to analyze the causal relations. And we also have the position in the brain so we can associate the relations that we see with specific brain regions. Uh, but as exciting as it would be to just try and find the relation between 80,000 cells, um, this project was really a uh, proof of concept uh, for this method being applied to neuroscience. So we tried to simplify this a little bit. So what we did, we divided the cells into what we called functional clusters. So essentially functional clusters are groups of cells in which cells that belong to the same group have a similar uh, neural activity. So we're, we're essentially splitting them by function, okay? And this is what our, I know this looks like a mice, it's not a mice. It's a fish, and you're seeing, you're seeing it from the top. So essentially, here you have the eyes, and over there you have the tail, okay? Uh, and this is the, the result that we get from the clustering algorithm. So it's already interesting to see, so uh, cells that belong to the same cluster have the same color. It's already interesting to see that cells to belong to in the same cluster are also aggregated in groups that appear uh, close in the anatomical position, and this tells us already something very interesting, which is cells that tend to uh, behave in a similar way tend to be aggregated together. I, will, I won't get too much into the biology stuff, but that's something pretty interesting. Uh, what we did was we selected a bunch of clusters, and uh, here we selected four clusters. So, um, you don't need to, need to know much, but essentially the clusters on the left side of the screen are associated with sensory input and processing, and the clusters on the right side of the screen are, are more associated with the motion and motor function. Okay, so it's already uh, interesting for us to see if the model is able to recover that there's some information going from the sensory area to the motor area. So what we did was we selected a bunch of neurons from each of these clusters and we performed the, CC, uh, the conversion cross mapping analysis between the neurons of these same clusters. So we performed this for several fish and this is the summary diagram that we obtained. So essentially um, the, the relations that occur more frequently appear in uh, thicker, darker uh, arrows and the arrows point in the, direct, in the direction in which the causal relation occurs. So what we can see here already is that uh, the, the main relations that we see go essentially from the sensory area to the motor area. And if we think about this, even for fishing, this is also true for humans, is that we tend to process the information that we get from our visual system, and we tend to adapt our behavior according to it. And the fish does the same. So the fish sees um, food or something, and he adapts the behavior according to what he sees. So it, it makes sense that there's uh, information going from the sensory areas to the motor areas. However, uh, this alone is, is not sufficient to prove. It tells us that the model um, appears to be working in, uh, in this concept, but we, to validate this, this, these results, we would need to go there direct, directly and activate those regions and see if the, the, the relations that we see are true or not. But it, it appears already to be promising to be applied in neuroscience. And if we are able to do this, we could be able to apply in, other, in many other regions and truly recover the connectivity in the brain uh, without intervening with the system. So that's uh, pretty fascinating for me. Um, but if you're not interested in neuroscience, I, I, I understand that. Um, so originally, this method was uh, used to explain the relation between sardine and anchovy, which was thought that they had a, a relation between them. But in fact, what they have is that the climate is forcing uh, those two variables. So it's the example that we saw in the beginning, where a third variable is causing those two. So they were able to recover that relation from the method. It was also used to analyze causal relation between users uh, in social media apps. And it was also used 
to uh, find a relation between the heartbeat, the heart rates, and the uh, temporal activity in the ep ep epileptic patients. Essentially, a temporal lobe is a lobe that um, appears to be activated when there's an ep epileptic event. So even though um, you, you could not be working in neuroscience, probably uh, this um, model would, would suit you because uh, essentially any prediction task, any uh, task with time series variables could be uh, used in this model. So if you want to know more about that, you want to talk about causality or you want to talk about neuroscience, please hit me up in, in the coffee break. Um, my thesis was then was split between IST and Champalimo Foundation, and this is my lab. I also like to thank them in the end because they helped me a lot. Uh, and yeah, thank you. <laughs>